Worst slide in the world. So look at this slide. This was actually a, a challenge from one of my colleagues. And what I'd like you to do after the presentation sometime today is take a blank piece of paper. And on that blank piece of paper, I'd like you to reflect on what you learned on the seminar. I'd also like you to reflect and think of the last patient with low back pain that you saw. And this drawing is actually my thoughts. My colleague asked me after seeing a patient, what were you thinking when you saw that last patient? So I sat down with a blank piece of paper and wrote down my thoughts. Now, this process, when you do this, is, is two parts. It's called reflection and metacognition. Metacognition is when we think about how we're thinking. And it's something most of us don't do often. So take a blank piece of paper, sit in a quiet room and reflect about your thoughts. So you look back at the last patient with low back pain and think, what was I thinking as I went through and talked to this patient, as I examined this patient, as I interacted with this other human being in the clinic? And as you'll see, as you write down your thoughts, you start to think about, was I uh, thinking in big pictures, which we'll talk about during the seminar? Was I presenting myself uh, appropriately as a professional? And also on the right-hand side of this, you'll see what was the patient thinking? Something we forget about in clinical reasoning is the patients are all, we're also examining us as we're examining them. So this is going to be your homework. I like to set homework right at the start so everybody can moan and groan. Metacognition, thinking about my own thinking. The famous uh, industrialist in America, Henry Ford, had a saying. He said, thinking is one of the hardest things you will do. That is why most people choose not to. So we're going to challenge ourselves. We're going to think about our thinking, take a blank piece of paper, and after the presentation, sometime, maybe an hour or two, so you get time to wind down and reflect, is think about your own thinking. Now, this is a page out of my manual that I, when I teach this course, and as you can see, it's a journey. And I always think uh, when we learn things in PT school, we may use the wrong words. And I'm, so I'm going to propose to you today that one of the things we might reflect on when we go on the journey with the patient is to think about receiving a history. And I want you to just ponder on that for a second. Traditionally, in physical therapy and physiotherapy and in medicine, we talk about taking a history. Is that really what we want to do? Do we want to take something from the patient? If you are going to listen deeply to the patient and be receptive, the word receptive means to receive. Just like today when I'm talking to you, the word audience comes from to listen, auditory. So one of the things I'm going to propose, if this is the only thing we learn today, to receive a patient's hist history. It is his and her story. So we need to be silent during this process. And in English, there's a wonderful conundrum and coincidence that the word listening and silent are made up of the same letters. So today we're going to look at reasoning and how our minds work and how we can learn together that we already have the skills and the tools to listen to our patient. So I'm going to take you on a small journey. We're going to cover two main topics, which are pattern recognition, and we're going to utilize this format. And I'm going to make the slides available and mark and send them to you after the presentation. Is everybody listening? Can everybody hear me okay? Hello? Is anybody going to, anybody listening? Okay. Yes. Good. I just want to make sure I'm not just talking into my void. So this is a format. This is put together because if you think about it, just like I asked you for homework, when a patient comes in, they are a blank canvas. We start with a new assessment. So this is a blank sheet, but it's got some areas filled in for us to consider during the assessment and the history. 
If you look, there's a book that says, I use the Rudyard Kipling, in fact, who was a, a British poet who lived in India. I use the who, what, where, when, how, and why method. Meaning, if you can answer those six trusty servings boys who always serve me true, you'll have a good idea what's going on with your patient. So we're gonna come back to this format. But if you look at the bottom corner, there's a big red flag. So one of the things we're gonna cover first when we talk about clinical reasoning is, how do we be safe? So at first, be safe. So we're gonna cover red flag thinking before we cover the other forms of thinking. Now I'm gonna to propose to you that when we see a patient, that the word red flag, they are not the serious condition. Red flags are indicators or signposts or things that point us towards the possibility of serious conditions. Now I, I've trained clinicians who have just come out of school to people who've been extremely experienced with lots of years of experience and still we struggle because we, we're worried about that our patients may have serious conditions when they present to the clinic. So I'm gonna put your mind at rest. This is called the index of suspicion. If you think as you see your patient, we will build up an index of suspicion based on the red flags. And to put your mind at rest, in a recent study running the USA in an emergency room, a department where people come with serious conditions to the hospital, they found that the incidence of red flag conditions were only between two to 5% of the patients that were seen in an emergency department in a hospital. Recent studies in physiotherapy in low back pain show it's around about 2%. So only two in 100 low back pain patients are going to present with a serious condition. And the sort of serious conditions we should consider when we see patients are things like fractures, cancer, infections, corda equina syndrome, which will present again with sciatica we'll talk about in a second, and probably inflammatory arthritides, the ones that affect the spine with multiple inflammatory conditions. Now in this study, you can see that the percentages of serious conditions coming to the emergency room that were needing urgent treatment, of those, only less between zero and 2% were actually spinal fractures. For cancer, it was from zero to 1.9%. And for infections, from 0.01 to 1.9%. So this is not even a high percentage in an emergency department. I'll try and move my slide. There we go. In this second study, it looks at how we calculate testing and relevant signs in the history. So if you look at this slide and you're familiar with, we won't go into too much technical detail, but when you look at this, the prevalence or the probability of having red flags, if you look on the left-hand side, it talks about trauma in over 50s. The percentage chance of having a fracture would be 13%. And trauma in the over 70s would go up to 20%. So even with those signs and people presenting, it's still not a high prevalence and probability. The key signs for cancer were unexplained weight loss, and that was 14%. Infection, fever, chills, sweating, and recent infection, 13.8%. And in cord requiner, the signs that we should look for are bowel and bladder changes. But even with these red flags, one of the things to think about, we've always been told, look for red flags. But even when you identify red flags, it doesn't indicate the serious pathology. So we need to be aware so we can beware. This is a nice tool. I'll give reference to my colleague, Paul Kerwin, who's in Dublin and Ireland. And this is a screendom tool. And it's an acronym S-C-R-E-E-N-D-E-M. And what it is, it gives you the cardinal signs to look for if somebody has a spondyloarthropathy, an inflammatory disorder. One of the ways I teach this simply is think of epithelial tissue. The epithelial tissues of our body will become inflamed. 
So if you're concerned that somebody is presenting with a serious inflammatory back pain, you need to use the screendom method, which is have a look at the skin. Do they have psoriasis? Do they have inflammatory changes in their skin? C, bowel and bladder, about irritable bowel syndrome, colitis or Crohn's. Do they have a relative, a genetic predisposition to have inflammatory conditions? And we can use the screening, the HLA B27 marker. Do they have eye issues? Do they have conjunctitis? Do they have iritis? One of the other cardinal signs for us as physiotherapists is early morning stiffness. Getting up in the morning, not painful, but extremely stiff. Have a look at your patient's nails. Do they have flaky, pitted nails? And then the other questions to ask them, do they have multiple joint issues, aches and pains, especially in the fingers and the distal IP joints? One well, of the other cardinal signs, if somebody comes in with back pain and has bilateral heel pain, that's enthesitis or bilateral anterior iliac spine pain, again, these are indications that you may have an inflammatory spondyloarthropathy. And does medication allow them to move easier? So this is a nice screening tool to go through the cardinal sign. I always say go from top to bottom, go from eyes, go to ribs, inspiration, go to fingers, go to bowel, go to bladder, and then to heels. So it's a nice screening tool for you to use for spondyloarthropathy. I posted in the chat box right at the start, there's a link. And if you want to learn more about, because we don't have time in an hour and a half to discuss that, there's a free webinar by two of the world leading experts in red flags. They are about to publish, I think in the next week, a paper in JOSPT on screening for serious pathology with low back pain. Linda Finucan and Chris Mercer presented a free seminar. It's one hour long and it's available at the website of SMM, uh, Southern Musculoskeletal Seminars in New Zealand, and it's free to you to use. So, we're going to play a game. I like when I, with my students, I always say that the, the more fun we have, the more work that gets done and the more learning. So we're going to look at the first clinical reasoning that we use. Now, this is generally, in the literature, is pattern recognition generally needs expert uh, physical therapy skills. But I'm going to propose to you that all of us have pattern recognition skills. We are already skilled in pattern recognition. So we're gonna play a game. You're gonna see four pictures, and I want to, in your head, when you see the pictures, who are these people? How much do I know about them? So remember the old saying, I know the face, but I can't quite put a name to it. So we're going to know the face and see how much information. So here's your challenge. Who are these four people? A may be most notable, B, not so much, C, you may have problems with, and D, most of you, if you follow sports, may know who this is. So, have a look at the pictures. Do you recognize the patterns? Do you know things about these people? So the answers are, of course, A, Session Tandulka, your famous Bollywood star, just joking. Session Tandulka, your famous uh, opening cricket batsman, one of the leading batsmen in Indian cricket. Two, Ian Botham. Now, for those that follow cricket, you may know Ian Botham was also an all-round cricketer for England, Somerset, and I think he played in Queensland too. He was my wife's favourite cricketer. C, you may not be familiar with, but that is Barry Bonds. He's, a famous, he's as famous as Sachin Tendulkar is in India. He is a famous baseball player. He was in the uh, series, World Series. He's famous because he was in a big steroid scandal in the USA. And D, Michael Jordan. Now, unless you uh, don't follow basketball, I'm sure some of you would have recognized the pattern of Michael Jordan. So we're going to play a second game. 
Uh, one more time, what are these patterns? Now, some of them may be easy to recognize, so let's go and have a look what they are. So, A, India, of course, the very country most of you are sitting in, famous for the Ganges, famous for Taj Mahal, famous for Punjab, where you currently are all uh, situated at the university. And that's about my knowledge of India. So I'm sure if you look at that big pattern and you recognized it, you are more expert with familiar things. So one thing to think about, as you see things as a clinician, you are storing patterns. This is called tacit learning, meaning you don't know why you know this stuff, but you stored it throughout your career. So one of the things we'll talk about this afternoon is how do I store information so I can recall these patterns? B was Australia. And that's my former homeland. I actually am Australian. I became Australian when I lived there. And it's famous for kangaroos, koalas, and all sorts of other things like the Sydney Harbour Bridge and the Opera House. D, a C, may not have been obvious. This is Iceland. Now, if you live in Iceland, you have probably recognised it immediately. And this is the thing. Remember, familiar, familiarity with a condition, a clinical condition, allows you to recognize the pattern. And D is my home, Minnesota, famous for the Minnesota Twins and the Vikings football team. So remember, we all have the skills of pattern recognition. Recognizing something is based on not being an expert, but being experienced. There's a difference between that. You can have an experience and a, learn from it and store a pattern. It doesn't take years. You don't need to be an expert. We all have the skills of pattern recognition. So when you do your reflection homework, I want you to think about, do I currently, when I see my patients, use pattern recognition? And it's called a heuristic shortcut. It means that without taking volumes of information, I can generate a hypothesis by using a pattern recognition, and then I can test it. And testing is important because a warning of beware. This is what's known as periodalia. And periodalia is the human ability to see patterns where none really exist. Now, as you're looking at this screen, you're obviously like me, seeing faces in these inanimate objects. And there are no faces. Technically, it's because humans have this skill of making things fit where there are no patterns. So as a clinician, we've got to be very aware that our innate nature is to produce patterns where none may exist. I call this the Michelle Obama. This is our fir uh, former first lady of the United States. Now, as you look at this photograph, and if you're familiar with Michelle Obama, or even just a familiar with people's faces, this looks like a normal photograph. But beware. Whenever we use pattern recognition, it's highly important we don't fall foul of what's called predictive programming making things fit. Because when we look from another angle, this is not what we realized. And if I go back, this is what you saw. This looks like a normal face. This looks like a normal pattern in the clinic. But beware, we must test even pattern recognitions. Otherwise, we may fall foul of what I've nicknamed the Michelle Obama syndrome, making things fit in the clinic. And we do this all the time and we need to be aware. So the second process is hypothetical 
deductive reasoning. And that sounds like a big, long, complex word. Pattern recognition is a form of hypothesis generation. It's a quick heuristic form of pattern recognition, of hypothesizing. And hypothesizing really is called induction. You bring from a specific piece of information and make a general guess, a little guess about what's going on. And deduction does the opposite. It takes from the general and becomes more specific. So as we are clinicians, we want to come to a diagnosis. So we take and receive the patient history and are making little guesses about what may be going on with this patient. So we're going to play another game. It's called the hypothetical deductive reasoning game. So here is a proposal to you. It has wings and flies. So I want you to think for a moment how many things you could come up with. How many hypotheses for it has wings and flies? How many can you generate? And the more, the better. And a word of warning I always say to my students, always have I don't know or other in your guesses so that we can test against our own hypothesis. So here's four suggestions, and you've five with the other. So my hypotheses, it has wings and flies, a plane, an insect, a bird, a bat, and something I may not be familiar with, other. Now the question to you as clinicians, if this was low back pain, uh, back pain and buttock pain, back pain with leg pain to the knee, back pain with leg pain down to the foot. How will we differentiate? So the key is, as skilled clinicians and as we become more expert, what question can we ask to eliminate one of the possibilities? So what question would you think you'd ask to get rid of one of these? And my question would be, is it living? Is it alive? Now you can see if you ask that one simple question, you can eliminate and keep three or vice versa. If it's not alive, it will be the plane. If it is alive, we eliminate plane and we're left with three hypotheses clinically. The next question you ask yourself, how do I get rid of one or two of the others? So the next question we ask is, does it have more than two legs? Now, if we ask, does it have more than two legs? Insects do, birds and bats don't. So we can eliminate possibilities again. If we're left with two, we can test. If we're left with one, we've come to our hypothesis compared to. So our diagnosis, if it has more than two legs, will be it's an insect. And the third possibility, does it lay eggs? And we can differentiate down. So you can see by generating hypotheses and then using deduction, where we eliminate possibilities, we can come to a diagnostic conclusion. Now, while I was out cycling uh, two days ago, I thought, is there a quicker way of doing this problem? So have a look at the problem from the top to the bottom. Can you shortcut this in your reasoning as you become more expert? And as I pondered on it, I thought, yes, you can. If you go back to the top and say, it has wings and flies, if you ask the bottom question first, does it lay eggs? And the answer is yes or no. You are left with two sets of two. If it doesn't lay eggs, you have planes and bats. If it does lay eggs, you have insects and birds. So you have made a shortcutting reasoning. So as you become more expert, you can shorten down your hypothetical deductive reasoning. So we're back to our assessment form. So as we you go through receiving a patient history and doing the examination, we need to keep an open mind and we need to have a way of storing patterns for the future. So if you have a look at this form, it's a format. In the left-hand top box, the who, where, what box, that's going to tell you about the patient and their life and how they live their life 
It will include their occupation, their history, their hobbies, and what they enjoy. The box with the body chart will tell you the symptoms. So this is going to be a format. You may have a different format in your clinic, but this is my format for my students and proposing to you so you can store these heuristic pictures and big patterns. Where is the patient pain, symptoms, numbness, tingling, pricking, burning on the body chart? And I generally get the patient to draw the body chart. Then the nature, nature of symptoms. How do the symptoms behave? Are they frequency, the duration, the intensity, the distribution of the symptoms. And the other thing I generally add, how much medication are the patients taking? So how did it start? Where did it start? And how has it progressed? So these will allow you to form patterns in your head. Have I seen this before? And then what we call the mechanical and symptomatic box. I used to be a McKenzie educator, so that's a, a bias from my former life. What things in the patient lifestyle will produce the pain or irritate it? What things in the patient lifestyle may calm the pain or eliminate it? And I always say this, there is no difference between receiving a history and doing an examination. Then we've got the red flag box, which we covered again, the link to the red flags. You can view that. It's a fantastic webinar and it goes in detail of how to assess red flags in low back pain patients. So I have a saying, and this is from the top left box about who these people are. We don't spend enough time, I think, when we're reasoning, considering people's age. So I, I made up this little poem, my, my homage to Rudyard Kipling, in the young, beware. In the old, take care. And in the middle, have a cautious fiddle. But if in doubt, do nout. A nout is a, a, a contraction in English for nothing. Meaning, if you are not sure or you're concerned there's a red flag, then do nothing and refer on to a doctor, an MD or an emergency department. So in the young, beware. Think about that up to the age of 18. It's not common to have musculoskeletal low back pain. We'd think so. And in the old, we have comorbidities. So we have degenerative conditions. People who are older, over 60, 65, have lived their life on the planet and have uh, probably had many comorbidities throughout their life. And in the middle, I call those the working age group, the populace, have a cautious fiddle as contraindications are less likely. Now, this is my gift to the world. It is when, when parents bring children, we're going to talk about children for a second with low back pain. I always teach the parents to put their mind at rest and do this quick screen. And it's called, are you eating, sleeping, drinking, peeing, and excuse me, pooping? This is a quick way of monitoring if children's systems are working fine. If a child has a serious illness, one of these systems may be imposed. I always think sleeping is a good indicator for children who have low back pain or have a musculoskeletal problem. If a child can sleep, I'm not that concerned. But the other four, are they eating normally? Are they drinking normally? Are their bowels and bladder working normally? And if that is the case, you can generally put your mind at rest and with caution that there's not a serious musculoskeletal problem. Now, after having said that children don't get musculoskeletal low back pain, this is a nine-year-old boy. Now, his father was quite an idiot because and I, I mean that respectfully because I am his father. This is my son. This is when my son was nine. He's actually upstairs in bed. He's 30 years old, so he survived this episode. But when my son was nine, he fell out of a tree. If you look on the right side, just lower down than his scapula, you'll see a scratch mark. He came in complaining of right-sided low back pain. When we asked him what had happened, he said, oh, nothing as children do. 
And of course, instead of taking to the emergency room or the doctor, I asked him to strip his clothes off and I took a picture because I thought this would be great for lectures and posterity. But after 20 odd years of seeing low back pain patients, I've never seen a child with a lumbar shift. And this is a lumbar fixed shift or lumbar scoliosis. And he had pain on the right hand side, just low back pain, no other complaint of pain. He's got rather wing scapular people will say, but I think that's just the position. So what would you do if this child came to your clinic? Some of us would be highly concerned, I'm sure. And as I said, I'd never seen this myself. So my treatment was reassurance and asked him about the, uh, is he peeing, pooping, sleeping, eating, drinking? And of course, I'm his father and those were all yes. So we put him to bed and just positioned him, made him comfortable. And when he woke up in the morning, this had all gone and his pain had gone away. So a word of warning, children are extremely resilient. And my only hypothesis is that shifts occur in disc problems. And I wonder if he had a minor disc irritation that put him into this position. If this hadn't have cleared in maybe 24 hours, we would have probably sought to have further investigation. So this is my son, put your mind at rest. Children are quite resilient. So here's the proposal I made earlier. We learn in PT school to receive a history, no longer taking a history, and then do an examination. My proposal to you as a group today is there is no difference between receiving a history and doing an examination. The patient has one witness, the therapist has none. The patient has all the information, the therapist has none. The therapist needs to learn listening skills, questioning skills to generate hypotheses and big pictures. I can verbally ask the questions for cordial equina syndrome. I don't need to test. If I can verbally ask my patient about serious pathology, surely I can trust them to ask them about the effect of bending, the effect of raising their leg up straight, the effect of bending backwards on their pain. Every test I propose, or some, the patient can perform themselves. And this has become an interesting proposal as therapists have switched over to telehealth communication of their patients during the COVID crisis. I've been teaching courses for clinicians to teach them every test we know patients can do themselves. And there's some good evidence just come out, just been published by Chad Cook's group, that patient self-examination of the hip is more accurate not less accurate, but more accurate for diagnosis than therapist and patient in the clinic. So something to think about. A second piece of homework, can I take every test I do on a patient and change it so the patient could verbalize it and do it themselves at home? Something to think about. So this is my proposal. As you go through your career, and mine's been 37 years, and as I commonly say, and Amara will attest to this, I am a numpty. I am a person who keeps an open mind. I, I believe that no matter how long you've been a clinician, you should uh, use the attitude of the learner, the idiot, the jester every day when you wake up, meaning a blank piece of paper to receive new information, new learning, a master, sometimes believes that they know everything and have a full cup. So, blank piece of paper, collect puzzle pieces from your patients, receive them, and on the right hand side, the more expert you become, you have the box lids or the pictures of the puzzles. So becoming a clinician is receiving those puzzle pieces. And the reason I say patients have all the answers is they're the one with the pieces. It is the clinicians who learn, need to learn how to receive that information and then generate the big pictures. What patients don't have are the solutions to their problems. There's a difference between the answer and the solution. So the job as we walk through our journey together, reasoning is 
looking for solutions to the problem, utilizing the patient's answers. Uh, Dr. David, uh, yes. there is one question that is uh, posted there for your, if you can answer that away. For a 10 years old child, is it preferable to take history from the child or the parents? That's a very good question. So I'll answer that now. I believe this. When, when a parent brings a child, and it, you know, it doesn't matter what age the child is, if the child can speak, I believe the child is the patient. So I pay great respect to the parents, and I always uh, make the children laugh. I, in fact, one of my passions is I, I, I would love to have a pediatric practice now I'm in my 60s. I mean, it's one of the things I'm thinking about doing, because I believe children have the better answers than the parents. Parents, there's two things when a child comes. Calm the parent, treat the child. And a lot of the treatment of children is actually just calming the parents and saying reassurance. But I insist when a parent comes with a child, as long as the child can talk, that the child gives the history. Because I believe parents are a second-hand messenger. The parent only relays their anxiety. They don't relay the truth. So with respect to parents, I always say to the children, this is going to be the first time that your mother and father can't talk unless we ask them. And the children always giggle. And of course, we do refer to the, 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 the parents during the history of the child can't relay the information. But remember, the parent can only remember what the child has told them. So a lot of the time when a parent comes with a child, they're just relaying their own anxiety, their own understanding of what's happened. So for me, and it may be different for everybody, and it, it, you know, for clinicians, it's tough depending what age or what, what experience you have. But in my opinion, the child is the one who gives the history. Remember, his or her story. So I hope that answers the question. So here we are. The biggest problem with humans is that we make errors. And here is a list of errors. They're big, long words. I'll, I'll explain them quite quickly. Pragmatic inference. And we all fall foul for this. And in fact, even doctors and the experienced surgeons fall foul for this. Pragmatic inference is where a patient comes into the clinic and says, oh, Mr. Poulter, I've hurt my hip and they point to the SI joint or their buttock and say, the pain's here in my hip, and they're pointing to their buttock. And the, the, the reasoning error that we make is that we, we now examine their hip. Instead of keeping an open mind and thinking, okay, one picture is the hip, one hypothesis is the lower back, another hypothesis is the SI joint. So the patient infers that it's their hip, and the therapist goes blind. Or the doctor sends a referral note saying, please examine the patient with hip pain. So it's inferring something practically that may not be true. So keep an open mind. Number two, we've already discussed considering too few hypotheses. And this is a, this is a problem when we say we are specialists. I always say I'm a hip specialist. And I always say, if you're a hip specialist, you will always see hips. And it's because you're focused on examining people because you're a hip specialist and you will probably find what you're looking for. So remember, even low back pain could refer to the hip. The spine refers to the hip. The SI can refer to the hip. So keep an open mind. Failure to sample enough information is one of the problems we talked about. Michelle Obama syndrome, meaning it looked like this, but I didn't do enough testing or questioning. Confirmation bias is just doing testing that would confirm your hypothesis. So you ask questions to say, is it Michelle Obama? Is it Michelle Obama? Is it Loba? So you're trying to prove something where scientifically in reasoning, we should be disproving something. Detecting covariance. So this is an interesting one. This means if I have knee pain and back pain, and when I walk, my knee pain and back pain both get worse. That doesn't mean they're related. That means I could have a sore knee and a sore back and walking. So we've got to be careful just because two sets of symptoms get worse together doesn't mean they are the same condition. 
and come looking at the next one, confusing covariance with causality is the same. The back doesn't necessarily cause the knee just because they change together. Uh, sir, there is one question if you uh, prefer to answer at this point. Yes, I can answer. Sure. What may be an appropriate strategy for a clinician to convert pattern recognitions to develop their own specific prediction rules in prognosing the back pain issues? Could you re repeat that one more time? The appropriate strategy to convert pattern recognitions to develop their own specific prediction rules. Okay. That's an interesting question. That, that could take a whole four hours to answer. So <laughs> what, one of the things, in fact, there's an interesting paper uh, that Chad Cook, who's a, a researcher here in the US, uh, he's over in North Carolina. Clinical prediction rules themselves have really gone out of favor in physical therapy because they lack validity. And I understand, I think I understand the question. So, it's very difficult to, to produce a heuristic that is predictive and valid. But as a clinician, we're always predicting. Part of pattern recognition is we see some things quickly and are trying to predict that, that this will be the prognostic factor. So yes and no. Be, be careful of prediction rules. That will be my only warning. They're not as valid as we used to think they were. It's very difficult for us to predict the outcome of low back pain. Okay. I hope that answers the question. Uh, I guess he should be satisfied. So just one uh, little question. So Sohaj Preet Rai has asked a couple of questions. So I'm yep. taking one question which is related to what you said earlier. Uh, we take consent from child or parents in case of minors. He's talking about the consent, sir. Yes. Well, in the US, we're, remember, I live in the USA. So consent is taken from the parent. Anybody under 16, the parents in charge of all consenting for treatment. So we have, we have forms that the parents, in fact, all parents must consent for us to do anything. So any manual therapy, any questioning, yes. So that, that's done up front at the start. So when I, when I do my introduction to the parents, I don't do it meanly. I do it in a fun, jesting way. But I explain to the parents that the child is the expert and the reasoning why I'm going to ask the child questions. And of course, a lot of parents, but it, there is a worse scenario. Let, let's talk about when a husband or wife come together and the husband and wife, the, the wife's the patient, but the husband wants to answer the questions. So it's not just the parent and child relationship we have to be cautious of. It's when anybody brings a significant other. So it, it's difficult. I always have to explain to people that the only way I take a history is from the expert, the person with the answer. So I hope that answers the first question. And was there, was there another question? No? No other questions? I think the second question is, David, uh, why we see a lot of uh, small numbers in terms of red flags in uh, emergency services? Well, the, the reason you see a small number is because they're not that common. If you look at the literature, uh, I think this is what happens. I think our fear magnifies the fact that we think they're common. And literature shows this. If you look at the population coming to any clinic globally with low back pain, the incidence of serious pathology in low back pain is around about 2 to 3%. So it's not just that there's not a large amount going to the emergency room. It's just that there aren't a lot of serious conditions. I think when we learn subjects at school, the word serious and the emphasis put on learning these conditions is important, but I think it over magnifies the incidents that you're going to see in your career. And I always say this, I always say to my young clinicians, if you miss somebody with cancer, they still have cancer. If you, the conditions we should worry about are things like corduroquinus syndrome, which is really well covered in that webinar because that's a developing condition that we can help somebody with immediately. As clinicians, we're not going to help somebody with cancer other than refer them on. 
we didn't give them the cancer, the patient has cancer. We can identify that, that will shorten the time to get them to a specialist. But as young clinicians, we shouldn't worry about missing things that are serious because the patient still has them. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but most of the time, if you have a serious condition, clinicians are just referring on to a more to an MD or an expert in that field. So I'm going to carry on. Otherwise, we'll run out of time and then you'll all shout at me. So the last two, inductive versus deductive is pretty obvious. Uh, creating things without testing them. Um, premise conversion is where A equals B doesn't mean B equals A. So that I always use the example, uh, all handsome men have suntans doesn't mean all men with suntans are handsome. You can't convert it just because somebody has something that is the same doesn't mean the reverse is true. For example, uh, if I have leg pain, it doesn't mean I have neuropathy. It just means I have leg pain. It could be referred symptoms. But if I have neuropathy, I could also have leg pain. So the two don't, uh, you can't convert one to the other, that it's always. And here's our dilemma. And I'm sure, in fact, I've been watching some webinars from India recently, and I know that Indians and Indian physiotherapists are just as biased as American physiotherapists, and we all have our favorite hypotheses. This is the famous six uh, clinicians, six blind clinicians and the elephant in the room. Meaning, this analogy is used a lot. If we are six blind clinicians, we only feel and palpate and appreciate the world around us. But as I said, remember, the essence of good clinical reasoning is communication and listening. If blind physical therapists were examining an elephant, why wouldn't they talk to each other? Communicate, listen, discuss, discuss with colleagues, get right down the homework, show it to a colleague. Remember, the error in reasoning is our bias is that we pick our favorite hypotheses, meaning I only see what I'm familiar with. Remember in all hypotheses, you should include other. I've never seen this before. So if these six clinicians got together, you'd actually probably realize there was an elephant in the room. And this is my example. When we do things like manual therapy or we see a patient one of the things we need to realize, especially with low back pain, back pain and sciatica, is that it's no longer accepted that these things are just physical problems. And when we examine a patient and we try to pull them apart, instead of looking at the big picture of the patient as a whole, it's like looking at your phone or computer or iPad and trying to take it to pieces and look at the parts and work out what's going on with the condition. So I'm a, a keen advocate for looking at the whole patient in a clinical reasoning perspective. Remember, this patient lives on the planet, they have emotions, they have a family, they have a job. Currently in the COVID crisis, they've got anxieties, they've got things imposed on them that are probably worrying them, and they've got low back pain. So remember, pulling a patient apart into bits will never reveal the whole. It's like taking a, a, a cow, cutting it in half, and trying to say, oh, now I've got two half cows. That doesn't work. You've got a dead cow and two bits. We need to think about, in the biopsychosocial assessment of our patient, that as we're going through their history and receiving it, what's happening to them emotionally? Are they distressed? Other factors, are they sleeping, are they eating, are they eating, drinking, sleeping, peeing, pooping, just like the children? Because there's so many factors that go into why patients have pain. And this is one of my favorite statements for my, it's one of mine for my students and for you and I. When we come to a clinical conclusion, thinking often stops. And let's go back to the question was asked about prediction rules. Remember, humans are prone to seeing things periodalia where patterns don't exist. Keep an open mind. There is always more than one answer to a question. 
I was asked to send a, a, a multiple choice exam for, for this presentation. The problem is in my world, there's always more than one correct answer to any problem. And you need to generate multiple hypotheses to, uh, so that you don't stop thinking just because you think I like seeing hips. In fact, I remember one of my students saying, I don't like seeing hips. And he went into a room and he came out and said to me, yeah, I, I can't make it a low back pain. And that very statement is what we try to do. We try to treat what we're familiar and comfortable with rather than treating what the patient presents with. So here's something to look at. This is one of our human biases. This is one of the things that happens in our profession. Understanding what your patient's saying. Your patient may call it a ligament strain, a disc lesion, a slip disc, or whatever they call it. And you may call it a facet joint strain. But remember, it's the same information. If you're a rabbit, you wanna see the duck. If you're a duck, you want to see the rabbit. And here is our future king of England, and we are all biased. So remember, Michelle Obama syndrome again. The way you see things, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And that's an important message in reasoning for clinicians. Challenge yourself when you see a patient to see them with new eyes. See the problem of low back pain from their perspective. We're always wrapped up in, what can I do to help this patient? Next time you see a low back patient, think, what can I do to understand this patient rather than help them? Because in my world, I'm a self-treatment specialist and I want to give them solutions to their current problem, not add more problems. And here's my proposal as we look at patients with low back pain is not to try and find the bits that are wrong but, and put them under a microscope, but take them and put them under what's called a macroscope. Look at the person themselves. Commonly, low back pain is not a diagnosable condition. 80% of low back pain is nonspecific, meaning we can't find a structural cause. And a lot of low back pain is driven by other things other than physical problems, such as emotion, lack of sleep, things going on in people's lives. So this is my message. I am a trained manual therapist. I teach manual therapy courses. And I've always said this to my manual therapy students. If you want to see your patient, you stood too close. We see our patients by standing back and looking at the big picture. And as I was preparing this talk and reflecting, this paper was published. And I thought, oh great, now I'm gonna to have to teach this too. But if you look at this, this was published last week in JSAPT, it's by Darcy et al. And it's, I call it the yellow brick road of clinical reasoning. It covers most of the things we've talked about this morning which are the biopsychosocial elements of back pain and reasoning. It's important that we think of the person as a whole as we're collecting and receiving their history for back pain. This, my only criticism is, it should look like this. I'm a big proponent of the patient is the center of everything we do and receive the patient history, listen to them, go through working with them. I always say ethos, pathos, logos. Ethos means to gain a patient's trust. Pathos means to seek to understand your patient and then logos to be understood. So before we can treat a patient, we need to walk a mile in their shoes, understand where things are coming from, listen to their whole picture, listen to them, listen to factors in their life that may be driving their low back pain that we haven't considered in the past and think these are not just musculoskeletal problems, these are humans coming with problems and my role is to offer solutions to them. Uh, sir, sir uh, there are a couple of questions, if you can take yep. them. I can take the questions, sure. Question is, could you please explain briefly about the cause and type of manual intervention 
which you incorporate in treat, treating the lumbar shift of your son, nine-year-old son that time? Yes, I can. In fact, uh, as a McKenzie therapist, you would probably think I was going to do shift correction to him or do some manual correction. One of the things I've learned, and this is where experience comes into play, in children, I, I see lots of children. In fact, one of the things I one of the things I specialize in is treating torticollis in children. So a deformity of the neck that looks like the lumbar spine. So I actually didn't do any manual therapy with him. I actually used what was called positioning therapy. And the easiest way to think about it is when somebody comes in shifted, and you can do this with any age group, they look like they're carrying a pig under their arm to mark it. So if you shift away from the right like my son was, he would have a pig in his left side. So my motto for all my students is lie the patient in bed, but don't lie on their pig. So you lie on the opposite side to where you will be carrying the pig. So my son was shifted to the left. He would lie on his right hand side in bed. And then it's almost like you're going to do the manipulation, the rotation, uh, lumbar rotation, flexion manipulation. You rotate the patient's shoulder and leg over the top and you just position them in bed. And I can actually, uh, I can post it on the, the procedure on, on Twitter and then Amara can share it with you all. It's called nice. sideline self shift correction. So that's what he did over overnight. But it's quite possible you could do a McKenzie shift correction manual therapy procedure. So a couple of more questions. Uh, this is manual intervention should be used in patient treating with low back pain with radiculopathy, if, I, if you can understand what uh, is meant by that. Yep. So I, I have a bias. I, I, as again, I'm a McKenzie therapist by heart. So I would suggest this. I have no idea what a patient needs until I, I'm in front of them and receive the hit. So if a patient has radiculopathy and in their history, as I'm listening, they can find positions or movements or self movements during their history that relieve that pain or centralize that pain, then I would utilize that rather than manual therapy. But yes, it's quite so. For example, if they are shifted with radiculopathy, we would probably use shift correction manual therapy. My progression is patient self movement. Patient with their own overpressure, therapist mobilization or uh, overpressure, and then manipulation. So I would go through a graded progression depending what the patient history is. I still use manual therapy. So the, the answer would be yes, if it was symptomatically beneficial to the patient. So I only use techniques. I'm a bit like Mulligan. I spent time with Brian Mulligan when I was in New Zealand. We, we, we were in opposing clinics, but we are good friends. We're the same logic a technique that relieves the patient's symptoms and improves their mechanics and function is a good technique. But I wouldn't just use a technique for the sake of using one. Okay, sir. Another question is, can psychological trauma caused back pain be treated by physiotherapy or it would need psychotherapy? Very good question. Yes, and there's, a, there's, a, there's actually a book by Dr. Sarno, who's actually recently passed, uh, and his whole premise was that back pain was psychologically induced from childhood trauma or things in our life. So the answer to the question simply is yes. In fact, psychologically, all back pain has a psychological element. It just depends how much and what the weighting is. And uh, I was at a presentation uh, two weeks ago from a therapist in Holland, and a lot of therapists in Holland are using psychological interventions with their back pain patients. It depends where you are in the world and what your skill set is. But uh, if you're following the current literature, a lot of things physical therapists are doing, the physios, is psychological intervention. And I always say this, listening to a patient and even just receiving their history is a psychological event for the patient. So, yes, it depends on your skill set. Uh, I actually work with a psychologist, so I generally, re things that are too difficult for me psychologically, I just pass over to my colleague. So I think it's good to have that resource. Okay. So two small questions, then we can proceed for the final closing. 
uh, one is how to correlate the clinical reasoning with radiological examination in lower back pain. Excellent. So I, I'm noted on Twitter and I, I actually have a meme. I actually have a, a set of uh, sayings about radiology. X-rays. X-rays are like uh, these dating sites. An X-ray is just a picture. So normally on a dating site, you don't put your ugliest picture. You put your favorite picture of yourself looking slim and beautiful. And that's the difficulty with X-rays. Studies show this. Just because something is seen on an X-ray doesn't mean it's symptomatic. There are big, big studies out there showing large percentages of the population who are asymptomatic have findings on x-rays, MRIs, and scans. So I always say this, an MRI or an x-ray is like a wedding photograph. When you look at somebody's wedding photograph, you can't tell who was angry, happy, sad, drunk, who had fallen out at the wedding. What you've got to do is take a history from the wedding party to find that information. So think of an MRI, it's a snapshot in time. It doesn't tell you what it, painful. I always say too, nobody in the world can look at an MRI and detect pain. We have to have a patient to tell us what is painful. But yes, so MRIs and scans are helpful in serious conditions and not too helpful in unserious conditions. Okay, sir. So last small question, then we can wind up. The, uh, how common is biopsychosocial factor in back pain case, whether it is acutely present, presented or chronic? Yes. Now, depending on your bias, most people would say, oh, the longer you have back pain, the more biopsychosocial you are. So here's, here's my word of wisdom. I, I teach about biopsychosocial, and I, I'm quite keen on this to get the message over. The word biopsychosocial is one word. It's not three separate words. It's not, it's not like saying inflammable. You can't separate them out. They are one thing. The example I give is this. Examining a patient and splitting them into bio, psycho, and social is like looking at water and trying to understand why water is wet and flows and quenches our thirst by looking at hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen and oxygen do not possess the qualities of water. And just as bio, psycho and social don't possess the quality of biopsychosocial. So yes, it's present in acute, and chronic conditions but distress is different in each case and so I, I can't predict some of my chronic patients have very low distress some of my acute patients are extremely distressed so biopsychosocial is what people present like it's not a thing it is just the study of the human condition if that is the way I can praise it. Right, sir. Now over to you, sir. Please. Uh, okay. Now, yeah. here's an example. This is, this is a test for everybody. The next slide I want you all to stare at and have a look at. Now, have a look at this slide. This is the essence of everything we've just covered. It's a big picture. You can make hypotheses. You may have seen it before. But we are, this is a patient presenting to your clinic and you are there with a dilemma. Does this patient have SI joint problem? That's the dark colored area. Does this patient have just simple discogenic lower back pain? That's the light bottom colored area. And you go through the history and receive the history and you come to the point where you need to test, you're left with two hypotheses, big pictures. Is this SI joint? Is this low back pain from discogenic? Now, everybody can probably see this. The top square looks dark gray. The bottom square looks light colored. 
I'm going to show you, this is why we need to be aware and beware. A simple test for the SI joint, a valid test, is the patient takes their finger and points to the SI joint. That's called the 14 finger test. If the patient does that, there's a high probability that the patient has SI joint problem. So what I want you to do is take your index finger and you place your index finger up against the screen in the middle of the two, two blocks and you'll reveal the truth about the diagnosis. The two squares are the same color. So if you place your finger across the middle of the squares, the two squares should look the same color. So when we receive a history and we've got all the information, we need to then learn, which is a whole new lecture, how to examine the patient with the least amount of tests to come to a conclusion about our patient so we can offer them solutions. So thank you. This is not the end. This is just the beginning. Absolutely. And I mean that really. So homework. Remember, you've got to take a blank piece of paper. Sit down in a quiet room with the blank piece of paper and reflect, which is a skill clinicians need to do often. Take a patient. I, I always say this to my students. Take one patient every day and reflect on what you did. Then the slide I started with, try and draw your thought processes, try and draw your reasoning, try and draw your path of discovery, the journey you went on with the patient and find solutions. Think about what your reasoning was and then you can learn to store patterns and heuristics. The second part of your homework is the free webinar on uh, red flags. And that's basically it. So I'm happy to answer questions. It's been a pleasure. And yes, now... sir. There are about four or five more questions. Yep, uh, that's okay. them out? Yes, sir. So first is, is it possible to correct the lumbar shift with the balance of stretching and strengthening exercises rather than using any kind of manipulation? Yes, it is. And in fact, the, the, the longer I have been doing this in my career, the, the more I think that uh, the less we touch the patient in the first few days, the better it is. And I, I always hold back shift correction uh, until I give the chance for the patient to self-treat. Okay. Uh, sir? Yeah. Yeah. The other question is, uh, is there a difference in psychosocial factors connecting in an acute case than in chronic case? The second part of the question is, can an acute case to solely represent a psychosocial factor? Yes. So the first part is, yes, again, and uh, there, are, there are certain questionnaires you can use to measure psychosocial behavior, sort of distress levels, uh, Zung depression scale, the Oswestry. And what happens is the history of lower back pain, we, we always think lower back pain is self-limiting and, and that it resolves itself. But the literature shows that most people after a year are still presenting with symptoms that are recurrent. And so what happens to patients is it becomes more distressing that they keep having episodic back pain. And the mystery of life is still, the unanswered question is why acute patients become chronic. We, we still have really no idea. And we don't know whether it's lifestyle, we don't know what, what the tipping point is, but we, we just know that pain is complex and it, it's not as simple as just having a physical problem. So yes, okay. from so acute just... to chronic. Okay. Yes, uh, last two questions. Yeah. Uh, one is, what are the evidence-based psychological interventions used in musculoskeletal pain and when to refer to psychologists or counsellors? Yes. So uh, if anybody uh, on the call is aware of Peter O'Sullivan's work with cognitive therapy, which is a form of uh, intervention for lower back pain, which, which, similar to what we've discussed today, looks at the patient as a whole and uses uh, their history, their, their life narrative 
receiving of the narrative as, as part of the starting point for their journey of recovery. And it encourages people, rather than uh, self-treat, but to reflect, just like we're doing, on um, what are the drivers? And, and this is something we should think about as, as physical. What are the drivers of their pain? They, they re use it to reflect on situational drivers. You know, is it certain times or stress or relationship issues? And I, I think most therapists have the skills to do this, but it, it takes a lot of learning. And so my advice to therapists is, if you want to just be a, a physical therapist and don't want to deal with the psychology, is find yourself a good psychologist to work with. I think it's important that some patients with back pain do see psychologists. Uh, last question, uh, as I have from board. As a clinician, when actually do you go for MRI? Yeah, I can't hear. Somebody's got some music. I can't hear. Okay. Can you please, can you please uh, switch off the audio and the video? Yes. So as a clinician, when actually do you go for an MRI? Oh, that's excellent. So reasons I would send a patient for MRI is, uh, and there's a standard. You can actually go online and look up the reasons. So if a person has low back pain, radiculopathy, and the radiculopathy has progressive neurological deficit. So if the patient is getting tingling that's becoming numbness and a drop foot, then you may have a serious pathology, like a large disc herniation. I would send that patient for MRI. I, the reason I send for MRI is because I think these people are surgical candidates. Always if you have cord equina syndrome, signs and symptoms. So if you have bowel and bladder issues, bilateral sciatica, unable to weight bear with sciatica, anal reflex is deficit, genital numbness, that will be a patient I will send for an MRI immediately. Because you've got 24 hours to get this person to a surgeon and get decompressed. I wouldn't send anybody with just simple low back pain. There's no indication for simple low back pain. But indications for MRI are progressive neurological deficit, having uh, progressive symptoms, unable to cope, as in you've had leg pain and sciatica. So most of the people I would send for lower back pain would be the sciatic patients with radiculopathy. Okay, sir. And uh, so I guess uh, that was a wonderful interaction and the tips that you gave. Uh, I would now like to pass on uh, to Dr. Amar Sohail, uh, because he is a person who actually uh, brought Dr. David Poulter on board. So we would like to uh, thank you, Dr. David, but I would like to formally invite on board Dr. Amar Sohail to please propose a for formal vote of thanks. Hello, can, uh, sir, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation, sir. Thank you so much for it. Uh, uh, I think there are many more questions I'll be uh, emailing you. Uh, yes, that's some, no problem. Uh, for answers. I think. Um, uh, apart from that, I personally had one question. After that, I'll, I'll proceed. Uh, do you always correct list in all the patients or do you prefer not to correct in some of them? So let's go back to that. So the only time I would correct them, uh, things to remember, is this part of the condition? will be the first question. If, if it's part of the condition, I would try and get the patient to correct it themselves first. Then we would, uh, I use the sideline technique and if necessary, yes, I would, I would always try to correct the shift if it's part of the presenting condition. You've got to be careful because people present with shifts that are like idiopathic structural scoliosis that aren't part of the condition. So you've got, you've got to really be aware that this thing that you're seeing is actually part of the presentation. But if it is, then yes, I would suggest correcting it. Okay. Thank you so much, sir, for the answer. So I think it was a beautiful presentation. Most of the participants are also messaging. Thank you for the presentation. And uh, we also, on the behalf of LPU and School of Physiotherapy, thank you for this uh, wonderful presentation and taking... Uh, time out so early in the morning for us and uh, presenting your thoughts, your experience with us. I hope, we... oh, I hope it was valuable. It's hard, it's hard sitting in a room at home talking to yourself. Yes, 
I think technology uh, has brought this concept of webinars nowadays a lot. So yes. it's, it's, it's a new way of learning it. Well, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Uh, hopefully my passion comes across in my talk. And uh, hopefully we can do some more of these things. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you. Just uh, thank you, Amar, and thank you, Dr. David. Uh, just one last uh, announcement for our participants. Uh, the external participants are not expected to go for this post-training evaluation, but for our internal students and faculty, the link is os.lpu.in. Copy and paste this in a browser to get an access. Your UMS credentials would be working there for your uh, UID or your registration number, and then the UMS password that you have. The feedback form for students has been created in a Google link. We've sent you the Google link. We've also posted it in the message. Do click on that and fill it. For the faculty, the link as of is on, on UMS Navigation, Human Resource Development Center, Feedback, Training Management Systems, and Feedback. So this was a wonderful session. Thank you once again, Dr. Poulter. Early in the morning, but refreshing and rejuvenating for all of us. And I'm Thank sure you. we learned a lot, lot more. And we would expect you to be back when convenient to you, sir. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. You all have a lovely evening. And those celebrating Ramadan, enjoy your evening meal. <laughs> Thank you. Same to you for your breakfast, sir. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm just about to go and get changed to do my cycling. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Yes. Thank you, Thank everybody. You. It was a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you. With this, we sign off. Please get on to the feedback and the post training evaluation. Thank you, Warren. And thank you. Thank all. you. Have a nice day, everybody. Thank you, sir. Hello, yes, sir. Yes, sir, good one.